So thank you very much for the kind introduction. And um, it's a pleasure to meet you all virtually. I'm going to talk um, a little bit about data sharing through Gene Matcher. Uh, and the Matchmaker Exchange. And after I finish, uh, Dr. Cerbero will be speaking about uh, data sharing through Variant Matcher. Um, okay, so to give you a little background, this slide um, represents the growth of uh, gene phenotype relationships uh, that are cataloged in Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man or OMIM, uh, which you just heard that I run, so I have a bias there, but there you go. Um, and that is a knowledge base of human genes and genetic disorders that uh, is based on the uh, published peer-reviewed literature and um, catalogs um, Mendelian phenotypes and the genes that cause them. So you see we're in quite a rapid uh, phase of growth. Um, and why are you now not going forward? That's very interesting. Oh, okay, it, it will, sorry. Um, and this is the database, if you're not familiar with it, omim.org, and please find me and I'll tell you all about it, but not in this lecture. Um, and it's updated daily. Um, and um, the outgrowth of Gene Matcher um, is that um, it it's, was developed by, by us um, from using the, through the Baylor Hopkins Center for Mendelian Genomics, which was one of the funded NHGRI funded centers of Mendelian Genomics. And we were doing exome sequencing to try to identify um, novel disease genes for um, Mendelian conditions. And many times when you do that sequencing, you identify one or a few good candidates, or you even are pretty sure this is the right gene because of variants in a fam, segregating in a family, but you only have one family. And that's usually not enough evidence to um, uh, make the case. So it was developed in order to um, find other people around the world who may have um, a, a other families or patients with a, a variants in the same gene and ideally the same phenotype to say, oh, that's causative. So it's designed for unsolved exons and genomes um, where you have a small number of candidates, not in genes that are already known to cause disease um, and you don't know much about the biology and you're looking for either another family or an animal model with a similar phenotype that would overlap your family might might be more evidence for the role of that gene in that disease. Um, so um, I think the first bullet is an, a repeat. Um, we only, you only put all you have to put in into gene matcher is the name of a gene. Um, you can put in uh, additional phenotypic information about the patient, but there's nothing that's identifiable. Um, and when you put in that information, it it looks for anybody else who submitted a, um, the same gene um, and automatically generates uh, an email to both or more than both, depending on what's happening, submitters uh, who can then choose to follow up at their discretion. Um, so you, the bottom um, uh, figure or this, this screen capture shows that you can put in a full name of a disease, um, the gene, which obviously you have to enter, uh, a genomic location and features. Any of those things can be matched on, but you have to have the gene. Um, and we started with genes as opposed to phenotypes for lots of different reasons. Um, one is that sometimes you don't have full phenotype information about a patient that's been sequenced. Um, also different, you can use different terminology to describe the same thing. And then you're not sure you're actually describing the same thing, but the gene is the gene and everyone can agree on a, uh, uh, either a gene, um, an entree or ensemble gene ID or a gene symbol. Um, Many dysmorphic features, their presence or absence is a subjective call of the clinician. Um, how much phenotypic overlap is required to identify similar, uh, similar individuals is subject to lots of different algorithms that may or may not agree and uh, maybe too narrow or too broad. So uh, the gene everyone can agree on. Um, and the other thing is that sometimes the same phenotype can be caused by multiple genes. Um, so this is the growth of this tool. It's um, actually for me extremely gratifying and I think possibly one of the best things I've done in my life. Um, so if you look at the, this is the whole, since it started in December of 13 and you can't even see the beginning because it's that little. Um, and this, I'll show you a better slide in a minute for the rest of it, but that those green bars are the number of matches. Um, and for instance, last month there were um, 340, almost 340,000 matches. Um, the data within Gene Matcher include um, 13,614 unique genes um, from uh, almost 54,000, um, over 54,500 submissions from 11,538 submitters all over the world. Um, and about 63% of those genes have at least one match. This just um, explodes the blue and pink that you couldn't see in the, pre in the previous slide. Um, 
uh, to show you that the, uh, the number of genes um, continues to rise every month and the number of matched genes continues to rise, keeping a pretty steady proportion of about um, 60 to, um, 62 to 68 in the last uh, several, or, I'm sorry, 60 to 62 in the last several months. Um, in the, by the way, the, the small decline here is that we just eliminated a dead email address. So you wouldn't match to somebody who wouldn't follow up with you. Gene matcher investigators and submitters, researchers, patients, et cetera, are from all over the world, um, uh, including uh, large portions of South America and um, some participation from Africa, which is also very gratifying to us. Um, who are these folks? Um, close to 8,000 are describe themselves as researchers, another 5,000, and there's some overlap obviously there, describe themselves as healthcare providers. There are 608 patients or family members who have submitted to Gene Matcher. Um, and then of the um, 13,614 unique genes, um, 318 of them were submitted by different model organism researchers looking for human matches to their models. Uh, mostly from mouse, but a few from other, other organisms as you can see lower in this slide. So, um, you know, okay, great. Lots of matches, lots of gene. What, is that, what does this mean? Um, gene matcher has been cited uh, by 452 publications as of the 1st of June, uh, in which uh, 329 or 77% were actually novel disease gene discoveries. So it's, it's really made a contribution to that, the growth of that first graph that I showed you. Uh, and you can follow this yourself if you'd like by going to genematcher.org and um, selecting the publications, which I've highlighted in red. Um, so Gene Matcher is also part of a, an international um, data sharing initiative. We were founding members uh, with um, Phenome Central and Decipher of what is now known as the Matchmaker Exchange. Uh, each of those circles around the, the light bulb with ideas about DNA um, uh, are members of the Matchmaker Exchange. And it's a federated system that allows um, uh, exchange of information so that people don't have to deposit it into each of these nodes. Gene Matcher is the largest um, by far, and it's the only one that lets any, any Gene Matcher and Phenome Central allow anyone to submit. The others are um, collections of big sequencing efforts. Um, and this is, these are the data from, from that information, in, in, encompassing that information. So these are the different nodes that are connected through uh, Matchmaker Exchange. Uh, not every node has to match to every other. That's a, an option of the node controllers. Um, but these give you the data. So Gene Matcher has by far the largest number of cases and the largest number of, un of unique genes, uh, followed by Decipher, which has about 250 different collaborating um, uh, efforts, including the large scale um, uh, deciphering dis developmental disabilities in the UK. Um, and some have very few and some have very many. And this continues to grow, new nodes add on and new patients are included. Um, and in terms of the publications out of the Matchmaker Exchange, uh, there are 37 um, published gene discoveries as of the 1st of June um, and 21 of the 37 overlap with Gene Matcher publications. So there are people who match within Gene Matcher and then people who match with other nodes within the Matchmaker Exchange, not including or including Gene Matcher. And um, I think I more than made up for my time because um, I think that we have, are now ready to move on to Dr. Sabrera, who's gonna talk about data sharing and variant matcher. And I promise she'll talk more slowly. Can you stop sharing Dr. Homer so I can share mine? Absolutely have done so, sorry. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you to the organizers for having us here today. Um, like Dr. Hammer said, oops, I didn't have my video on, sorry. Like Dr. Hammer said, I'm going to talk about a little bit more about data sharing and our newest tool that is variant matcher that it's the uh, came after gene matcher. So in the last 11 years, you probably all know next generation sequencing became the main methodology to investigate and identify um, disease causing genes and variants and the whole exome sequencing and the whole genome sequencing that was performed the last 10 years generated a large amount of data and the analysis of that large amount of data has led to the discovery of many disease causing variants and genes and dr Hammer showed you the graph showing the 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 number of phenotypes and genes 
associated to these phenotypes that have been discovered throughout the years. But here you see that in the last 11 years, the number of genes associated with a phenotype in omin went up from 2,500 to 4,500. So to do that, actually many steps between the generation of the data and the identification of these genes and variants had to be improved. And one of the main steps that had to be improved was actually data sharing. Um, data sharing became an essential part on the process of discovering these disease causing genes and variants, but many things had to be improved uh, to get that actually done. When we started working with sequencing as part of the Baylor Hopkins Center for Mendelian Genomics, Dr. Hamash, myself, and Dr. Valley, who is the PI for the Baylor Hopkins Center for Mendelian Genomics, and many others, had many discussions about how to do that. And these are just some of the questions that came up. And we could spend all day talking about them, what to share, phenotype, genomic information, gene level, variant level, what we need to share, what we can share, what we can share and still keep ensure that the patient has the confidentiality and privacy that he needs to have or she needs to have, how to share, where to share, with whom to share, so we can actually have people around the world having access to this data and to the, to the benefits of having this access to this data and this information, how to ensure that the researchers that generated the data are recognized for their work after the data is shared, and how to do it in a way that we still comply with the IRB um, requirements of our institutions and of our countries, how to share the data across countries. So this was discussed many times and has been discussed and is being discussed. And throughout the years, many databases that are data sharing database have been created. There were some that already existed years before this whole discussion exploded with next generation sequencing, but many of them are actually new and we have many different kinds of data that is shared in these databases. So some of them are more restrictive because they actually allow you to access the full raw data, sequencing data, like these ones that I'm, I'm listing here, the NIH-based dbGaP, NVIEW, Kavarica. NVIEW and Kavarica are actually very new. In the last two years, they were created. And then some of them are of public access, but you have access to less information. It's more of a gene-based variant level kind of access that you have in there. Some of them are very uh, old, like Decipher, that started with sharing data about copy number variations. And you have many others that are listed here, but they are not all. I, these are the ones that I mostly use in my lab when we are doing research, but there are many more. Um, the problem is like neither one of them is perfect. All of them have something in there that could be uh, appremorated or improved on us. So the main problems with any of them is that we don't have access to detailed phenotypic inf information about the patient himself or herself and about the family. We don't have at all in neither one of these databases any access to family history. And it's very hard in most of these databases to have access to the patient or the individual that we are interested on to reassess any kind of feature or information about the family history that we would like to. Sometimes, most of the times, you cannot even reach out to the owner of the data that was put in the database. So basically, when you find, you go to one of these databases and you find that the three people have the variant in the gene that you are interested, you cannot really reach out to find out what's the phenotype of these individuals. Do they have the same disease that you are interested on or not? So thinking of it, you saw how we developed gene matcher and variant matcher was following the same ideas and the same concerns. We thought that we wanted to develop tools that would, we would share as little as possible, but as little as needed and share what was essential. So we could make they are sharing a little faster and we could actually allow people to move on and share further and get the information that was needed to really define if this variant or this gene is its cause in the phenotype that you're investigating. With gene matcher, like you saw, we started sharing 
the genes, and with variant match, we are actually sharing the variant level information, and we always share the name and the contact information of the person who is responsible for that data in the database. That way, people can connect to each other, they can start a collaboration, they can exchange information and get to the final conclusions about the gene and the variant. We also ensured in both of them, gene match and variant match, that the notification was simultaneous. Like every, all the parts involved on the match would receive the same information at the same time. And this was actually very important because researchers I still, 10 years later, is still concerned about being scooped, about losing that data once they share it and losing the opportunity to write the paper, write the grant. So that formula that we have here in this slide worked very well to gene matcher, like you saw, and we decide, decided to apply the same to the variant matcher. What's variant matcher? Variant matcher is a tool that we developed to actually share the data from our own sequencing projects. The main risk sequencing project that has been going on um, in our labs in the last 10 years is the Baylor Hopkins Center for Mendelian Genomics. Like I said, Dr. Val is the PI, Dr. Hamash and I are co-investigators on it. And this project has sequenced more than 7,700 individuals. And for more than half of these individuals, we have phenotypic information in this database that we created, the PhenoDB database. And as part of this project, we have this discovered many novel disease genes. We have here more than 314, now it's more than that. But we decided that we wanted to make available the variants that are in there available to the scientific community to improve on the classification of variants. Because once you discover the gene, you still have to decide or define if the variant in that gene is benign or pathogenic. This is for research and clinical work. Actually, in the clinical work is even more important because we have now many patients that receive a report that says that the variant is a variant of uncertain significance because we don't have enough information to say one way or the other. So whatever we can uh, uh, make available to improve the classification of these variants is very important. We have all the sequencing data and we try to make it available in a way that would still comply with our IRB requirements in our institution. So we created variant matcher. A user can create an account and can, after being approved by us, search or query on up to 10 variants per day, per individual, per user. And they can include the phenotypic features of their patient. Or, uh, and if they do that, if there is a match, the email notification will tell them about the features of our patients also. And they can save that search. So the search can be redone monthly in case we add more information to the database, more sequencing data, they will take advantage of that. So if they save, it's saved here, monthly it will be run again. And whenever there's a match, they will get the notification. All the parts will get the notification at the same time. As of June 1st, we have sequencing data from 6,151 individuals in the database, what sums up to about 890,000 variants, unique variants. User, we have 662 users from 43 countries that created an account, and we have had 69 variants that matched to 816 individuals in our database. How has it benefited the community? When we had our 61 first variants that matched, we took a look. Uh, they were in 56 genes. 40 of these genes were actually disease-causing genes, and most of the variants were actually variants that were very rare less than 0.1% in the population, and that had been classified as variant of uncertain significance by a clinical lab. The individual came to variant matcher and matched to many individuals in our database that had um, different phenotypes or that were unaffected. And based on that information, these users were able to classify the variants as likely benign instead of variant of uncertain significance and less likely to be causing the phenotype of their patient. So that was very useful for clarification for the healthcare providers or researchers who are investigating that variant. But we always say that it needs to be, these conclusions need to be taken carefully and some things need to be taken consideration like incomplete penetrance, 
variable expressivity of the phenotype and age of onset of the phenotype. These things may look like, because of these things, a match in a variant may look like it's not a match on phenotype when it actually is. So we have to be careful of these conclusions, but most of the times it was clear that the variant was actually likely benign and not variant of uncertain significance, and it was very useful. So as we said, variant match is the newest tool, but we keep improving on both of them. Variant match right now, we are actually implementing new query capabilities. And for both of them, we keep looking into connections. We want to connect to as many other databases that do similar kind of work as possible. Uh, we are right now looking working with Paradigm and Model Matcher. These are databases that are focused on model organism research, and they have uh, model organism researchers in there, and they want to connect to individuals who have human patients with variants in the genes of interest. So we are looking to making connections with these databases. And with other databases that are newer, that are actually also have patient information and variant level information like Franklin uh, that's based in Israel and Gene2MP that's actually based um, here in US in UW. And we are also connecting to the Beacon Network that is actually a place where you go and you query your variant and you see all the other databases out there that have your variant. And then you can go to that database to get more information about the patients or the individuals that have this variant or mutations in this gene, the of interest of yours. So this is where we are right now. And I will stop and we think we can take questions. I don't know how long I talked, so. Great, wonderful, thank you. Um, so just a reminder, if people have questions, please enter them into the Q&A session. Um, I will go ahead and get things started. Uh, and, and this is a question for both of you, although the slide was the was one of the first ones that Ada showed. So one thing that struck me was that the curves, the OMIM curves that you see or showed there initially, they look very linear, right? So that with growth, right? So that implies that we're still in a pretty early stage of discovery, which is very exciting. Um, so I'm just curious what your thoughts are on where you think the limits of that is going to, I mean, you, you know, in some, I think I, one of you said 13,000 genes are already in there. Humans are supposed to have, you know, depends on who you believe, right? 30,000, I'll, I'll pick that as a ballpark, right? Um, you know, so, so where, 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 where do you think this is going? This is my very favorite question. So if we have 20,000 protein coding genes, and then there's supposedly about 25,000 long non-coding RNAs or microRNAs, right? So how many of them will give you a disease you can recognize in a human? <clears throat> so mouse, model, mouse studies suggest that about 30% of genes in mice when mutated cause embryonic lethality, okay? So we're not gonna see that. We might see it as infertility or repeated pregnancy loss or something along those lines. And we are actually increasingly finding those, um, but we won't find all of them. You know? Um, and then there, there's gotta be some redundancy, right? So there have to be some genes that are on their way out evolutionarily. And so, or that, or that are so, there's many different copies of something that works similarly. So you can lose it and be fine. But uh, my guess is under the right environmental circumstances, other than the 30,000 embryonic lethal, which we probably can still identify some of those, the rest should have a Mendelian phenotype in the right circumstances. And the question so, is, what's the asymptote of that? You know, how far do you have to go to find the rest of those? To me, what is what is very interesting is that we still have a lot to understand of the genome, and these mm -hmm. and these genes may be underdiscovered under because of that, because we have not looked in the right place in the genome. So we still don't know how to analyze non-coding variants. We are still not really analyzing with whole exome and whole genome sequencing all the structural variants that we should be. So we have a lot to learn about the genome and a lot to, to learn how to find the genome. And I think we will find much more once we can get to these variants. Mosaicism is another thing that is barely untouched. And mode of inheritances, like oligogenic mode of inheritances that we also didn't learn how to 
investigate very well at this point yet. So Dr. Valli used to say that he says that he thinks there is one phenotype for every gene in the genome. May not be a disease phenotype, but there will be a phenotype. Um, the challenge will be to us to learn how to understand the genome to find the variants in these genes that are actually causing the phenotype, I think. So it's, it's exciting. We still have a lot of work to do. So there, like there's one more wrinkle, which is of known disease genes currently, 30% of them cause more than one Mendelian phenotype. That also. So, yeah. and, and since some, many of these are newly discovered, it takes some time to understand the range of phenotypic variability with a gene as you get it, you know, whether is this just broader of the one disease we understood or are there actually completely separate phenotypes? So all of these are nuances that we just, we, you know, we're learning, we learn every day. We are nowhere near done, let alone, I mean, it's not the beginning of the end. It's not every even the time end. we learn something, it gets more complicated. Exactly. <laughs> It's, 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 it's also fascinating from the standpoint that, you know, some, some diseases are really complicated. Well, many diseases are, are, are many quite complicated and that there's not like a single gene locus, right? So there might, you know, something like diabetes, right? So which, which has, you know, all different kinds of who knows how many variables and how many different, you know, and so this is where, you know, variation, just as, you know, diversity sort of comes in at the theme of this meeting has become so over, almost just dauntingly overwhelming to think about, right? Because now you're not just talking about necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship, right? But you're talking about a many-to-one relationship and, that, and maybe that's plastic or fluid, right? So that, you know, one patient or one individual, you'll have, you know, one set of markers, genes, whatever, you know, and differences that'll lead you to that. But in a different background, different person, right? That might be masked in some way. Um, that, yeah, that so is, how, how do you wrap your hand around that? Well, that's known. I mean, each, so even in the very rare disease patients I take care of, and we know the fundamental problem, they, what happens is you've broken homeostasis. So all that, the rest of that variability that might manifest in decades, actually manifest as their unique presentation in childhood. So it is, so if you look, if you ask the question overwhelming, each patient is unique. Each, yeah. each of us is an individual with our own constellation of variation, of environmental exposures and of chance. And all of those things come together. And environmental exposures is, is everything from societal, you know, economic things to what, which pathogen you've seen to how much pollution is in the air. It's all of those things. And so we're, we really are each unique. I mean, we, you, we have to think about, go ahead, Nara, go ahead. No, no, the, I'm saying, exactly. This is so interesting when you see the same family, the yeah. presentation of the same disease, all the family members have the same disease causing variant and it's still some of them are so much more severe and some of them have such a milder presentation of the disease. And this is because they have 3 billion other variants in there interacting with the environment in a different way. And we, we still have to figure that out. 